Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Global Health Leaders Conference. Today, we are joined by Dr. Rupa Dot. Uh, my name is Siam Rezwan, and I am the conference chair. To give a brief introduction to Dr. Dot, she is a passionate advocate for gender equality in global health and a leading voice in the movement to correct the gender imbalance in global health leadership. She is also a practicing internal medicine physician in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Dot is particularly committed to addressing issues of power, privilege, and intersectionality that keep many women from global health leadership roles and to opening up spaces for the voices of these women to be heard. Determined to build a movement to transform women's leadership and opportunities in health, uh, Dr. Dot co-founded Women in Global Health in 2015. Today, Women in Global Health has more than 24 chapters, 50,000 supporters in more than 90 countries, and continues to grow. She advises the World Health Organization on matters of health workforce, gender equity, uh, and universal health coverage. Dr. Dot was recognized as the Gender Equality Top 100 and the most influential people in Global Policy 2019. Uh, Dr. Dot, we're so happy to have you at the Global Health Leaders Conference today. Uh, I'll now go ahead and give you the virtual stage. Great, right. thank you, Sam, for such a great welcome. And I'm so excited to join all of you and to see that there's so much interest in the next generation in global health. Um, I'm sure that part of this has to do with the fact that we're um, amidst of one of the greatest uh, um, historical disease outbreaks and pandemic, and it has affected lives um, in all around the world and especially in the United States as well too. So um, I know that you know today's discussion I'll be focusing uh, much more on the gender equity aspect, but wanna just acknowledge it's great to see the next generation so interested in global health. I hope that you stay committed to the pathway it is a really exciting field, um, multidisciplinary. And I personally am a physician and I practice clinical medicine about 20% of the time. And the rest of the time I'm leading um, women in global health where we advocate for gender equality, especially by looking at things from a power and privilege lens. So I'll be introducing you to some of the latest concepts around that, but know that in a field in global health, um, there's so many different ways to engage in it. Um, you can be uh, on the clinical side of it, or you can be on the communication side or, um, you you know, there's, there's just so many options out there. And I hope that that's been something that has been echoed in the conference and then really encourage you all to really make the most of this uh, point in your life of really just exploring your interest and going in as many different directions that you are inspired to. And I hope to introduce you to at least one way at looking at global health is from a power and privilege lens and encouraging all of us um, in society to look at our own power and privilege and see how can we be creating more equitable societies because we know that if there's anything that we learned in this pandemic, that there are wide spanning inequalities in society, the pandemic has magnified those um, and also uh, further exacerbated those. So on that note, I'm gonna just um, turn to my slide deck here, but I wanna encourage all of you to please use the chat function, introduce yourselves, introduce your interest to why you're here at the talk um, and also use um, the Q&A function. I think CM, you'll be taking um, some questions for me to answer uh, at the tail end um, of this uh, presentation, but really encourage all of you to be as interactive um, as you'd like to be. Um, so I'll be focusing on today's talk on gender transformative leadership, a pathway to equity in global health. Uh, some of the uh, core objectives of this talk is to really introduce you to some of the challenges and barriers in gender equity and global health leadership, to provide examples of gender transformative leadership and explain the concept and what that is about, and to also highlight approaches to transform global health to be more equitable in leadership. Um, so briefly about women in global health, um, this was included in uh, the introduction for, but for those of you that aren't familiar with the organization, um, we started off as a movement in 2015, and that makes us very unique in comparison to other global health organizations out there in the sense that we have um, 24 chapters around the world and growing demand of chapters, and we really use um, the, the power of people to leverage their influence, whether it is in their individual leadership or in their um, organizational leadership to drive the agenda of gender equality. Um, we have people from 90 different countries represented in the movement and continue to grow. And uh, more than 63% of our chapters are based in low middle income countries. Um, and why I point that out is that it's um, really core to women in global health values that um, we are working with uh, people from all different backgrounds and especially women from all different backgrounds to really set the agenda and drive gender equality in their own context as leaders. 
Um, and this is just a snapshot globally of where we have chapters. Um, we have uh, additional 20 in the pipeline waiting to be launched. Um, so in the last year of the pandemic year, we actually saw an increase in the demand, um, especially amongst women, but also um, allies to the movement of other genders really supporting the cause. Um, my team is actually based all around the world. We have a very unique model of um, having already operating in a virtual world before the pandemic. So I'm based in Washington, DC. Um, but as you can see, my team is all over from Pakistan, Kenya to Europe. Um, we will have a presence um, in uh, nearly almost every continent besides um, Australia, where we have a chapter in the very, very far, far east. Um, and then how women in global health approaches gender equality. There are a lot of different groups out there that work on women's rights and gender equality. But for us, core to it is looking at things from a power and privilege lens. Um, we see that the gender uh, inequalities exist because of the difference in power um, uh, relations in that um, certain groups have more power than others, certain genders have more power than others, and particularly men in most societies have more power than women. Um, but we know that it just isn't from a gender perspective or biological sex difference, but there's also um, other aspects of the identity, whether it's race, uh, um, geographical, religion, socioeconomic status, ableism, um, and we look at uh, gender equality from all those different intersecting aspects of one's identity. Um, we also try to focus our work focusing on really bringing the women who are the least represented, the hardest to reach, traditionally left out of the global health dialogue um, to be part of the, driving the agenda in global health. And this includes engaging uh, women in the health workforce and especially women that are um, nurses, midwives, community health workers are key, uh, key members of our movement. And so when I talk about the concept of gender transformative approach, I want to introduce you to the theory of um, how do we look at um, approaching and transforming um, gender inequities. And so if you look at the spectrum, and this is um, coming from the World Health Organization, is that we can be at the one end of the spectrum, which is looking at things um, from a gender unequal aspect. And this means that, you know, some of our programs, policies, and approaches might actually be exploitative. This means that we are perpetuating gender inequality, purposely giving uh, men more privilege than women. And an example of that is that there's still, um, you know, dozens of countries around the world um, that have laws that prohibit women from taking certain jobs prohibit women from taking night shifts, for example. And this, um, and there's certain countries where property is not able to be passed um, um, into the hands of women. And so these are examples of how there are gender exploitative um, policies and uh, societies where um, men have greater privilege than women and it's by design. Um, and then there's the gender blind aspect. That's where um, there is a lack of acknowledgement that there is a difference and it is when um, the programs are ignoring the gender norms and roles and um, very often it can reinforce gender-based discrimination. Um, an example of this is uh, when we take a look at health systems um, during the pandemic, many of the personal protective equipment that um, was available has been designed for male bodies and not female bodies. And that was a, uh, an example of gender blind policies. A majority of the health workforce are women and I'll be covering that data shortly, but without acknowledging the fact that the workforce is majority women or there is a significant portion of the workforce that are women and not designing appropriate personal protective equipment. Um, that's an example of gender blind policies. Um, the third is where we start seeing that there is awareness, um, that uh, there is a, a effort to be gender sensitive, and this is about considering the gender norms and roles that exist, um, but it does not address the inequality. So that means that there is a, a, an acknowledgement that men and women have different needs and for the purpose of this uh, talk, I am simplifying it to just non-binary terminology um, and uh, keeping it um, just talking about men and women for gender truly is a spectrum. Um, but the gender sensitive is where there is an acknowledgement, um, but it doesn't mean that the programs or policies are being designed in a way to address inequality. And then we get to the really when change starts happening, and this is where programs and policies might become gender responsive. Um, and that me this means that they consider the specific needs. Um, so it means making, um, for example, um, 
health um, programs that are sensitive to adolescent girls in a way that there might be youth-friendly clinics specifically for adolescent girls to increase their access and use of sexually productive health and um, services, for example. Um, and then it does consider barriers and access to resources. So the fact um, that in uh, women might not have as much, um, you know, economic um, resources to access or they are working uh, often from home um, in an informal market and they do not have some of the, the formal tools or mobile technologies in some places. And so there's an attempt to actually consider those barriers and designing programs so that um, the health services, for example, are, are reaching those um, hard to reach women or in some societies it's about men having harmful masculinities and not willing to access health services and acknowledging that and trying to respond to it. And then gender transformative, which is where women in global health positions um, itself and where we have been advocating for the last five years is where we start addressing the root drivers of these gender-based um, inequities. And this includes looking at the power that men and women have and making sure that there's more power in the hands of women in an equitable way so that they can make decisions about their own bodies, they can make decisions about their own health, and they can also shape the health agenda so that they're seen as decision makers and influencing that. It really aims to uh, foster progressive changes in power relations between genders. So there's an acknowledgement that um, it, this is a constant process and that one has to um, do a gender impact assessments and look at the power differentials and keep designing programs to again, look at what are those root drivers and as those root drivers change, readdressing it. And so it is a very active process um, and transformative is um, about going to the root drivers and changing them. So this is where we like to um, see policy programs be is um, the gender transformative, um, but often they stop at the gender sensitive area. And this is something that we are struggling with in some of the global agreed um, uh, uh, conventions and um, declarations that have been agreed at the UN level, they often stop at being gender sensitive. And what we really wanna see is they become gender transformative. And so how do we define gender transformative as a practice or a framework? And so for us at Women in Global Health, we are looking at it from the fact that it is about gender equality, but it's also about women's rights. And um, we will have conversations about power and privilege, especially in places where they don't want to acknowledge the power differential and, and say that, yes, that our societies are shaped in a way where boys and men have more power. And what do we need to do to transform that so that women also have uh, you know, equitable power in decision making? We approach it from an intersectionality aspect. And I uh, mentioned this earlier that we don't look at gender on its own. It's really critical to look at gender with all the other identities that people have um, and that impact their life, many that they're born with. So looking at um, race, um, a caste, religion, um, socioeconomic status, ableism, these are some examples, um, also sexuality as well. And then being inclusive in the effort of uh, making uh, it a point that um, programs are doing the outreach um, and not necessarily saying, well, you know, we don't discriminate, so it's up to people to join us, but there's an active effort to be inclusive. And this is also about leadership at all forms, not just looking at the head of an organization, but looking at leadership at at the community level, leadership in um, at every level of an organization, and looking at organizational leadership and sector-wide leadership too. So the, the point is that it's not just about one person driving the agenda, but that um, the transformative aspect is that it's, um, it's individuals at all levels of an organization, but also organizations can be the catalytic um, driver of the transformative change and inspire um, leadership as an organization and amongst the sector that they're engaged with. Um, and then the reason we um, view, view this as a, a constant ongoing process is that um, any organization or any program or any society, there might be a different point of the, um, the circle of gender transformative leadership. So it is a work in progress. It is a progressive realization. There might be aspects there are, that are equitable in a society, but other aspects that are not. And a prime example is looking 
looking at Nordic countries. So countries such as Sweden um, or in Finland and um, Denmark are often rated as the countries with the greatest gender equality. Um, Iceland is another one in, in, in that category. But when you take a look, even in that country, there are examples where there are gender inequities in pay gap, there's gender inequities in the, the violence that women face in, in society. And so even in those societies that are considered to be the most gender equal, we know it's a work in progress and, um, and it is a process for them to realize that um, they haven't truly reached um, gender equity in all ways and forms. Um, and so I'm gonna uh, transition now to talking about the power of data and um, what do we know? So the first question I have for all of you, and I'd really like you to use the chat function is, um, how many years do you think it will take to achieve gender equality? Oh, great, I'm seeing a very wide range here. All right, great. So I'm seeing ranges which are going um, as low as 10 years and then um, going all the way up. I'm trying to catch with the highest number I, I've seen here, but definitely into the hundreds. Um, so, and, and some have said several generations, uh, potentially three generations. The estimate by the World Economic Forum is it's going to take 135 years to achieve gender equality, and that is including education, economic, and political power. This past year, the pandemic has set the world back by almost 36 years. Um, we were really excited um, in the gender equality community when the World Economic Forum estimated before this pandemic that it would take us just about 100 years. Before that, the estimates were um, going up to almost 250. So the wide range that we're seeing here um, that all of you have guessed is, is really fascinating because we um, have a tend tendency to see you know, gender equality um, from our own perspective of where um, we are exposed to seeing women leaders in maybe higher numbers or seeing many more students um, that are women in a field. And then the perception is that because there's so there an increased presence of women around that that means that they are that, the, that we're achieving gender equality. But in reality is globally, um, and even in the United States, women do not have equal level of political participation. Um, and, uh, and that's where we see the greatest gap. And then particularly around the economic power is another one that's lagging, but education is actually starting to close. Of course, that's not universal in every society, uh, but the measures that World Economic Forum uses is Around, around those um, aspects. And, and with the health aspect, which I won't be covering too much, women have higher life expectancy than men, but what it also means is that women are often aging and have less economic resources. So they're often in poor, um, in poor um, health and um, living in poverty. And, uh, and that is um, you know, an aspect of where if you only look at one number, which is life expectancy, it would look like you know, women are doing much better. But in, in reality is while they might outlive men, um, they're often in um, worse circumstances. And so when we take a look at the pyramid for global health leadership, and um, this is one that Women in Global Health has been calculating since um, 2016, is we identified the sectors that we feel are the most influential in categories in, in driving um, global health. And so what we have is that majority of the base of the pyramid is the workforce. And the workforce in global health, if we take a look at care workers, 90% of them are women. If we take a look at um, health and um, health workforce, particularly those that are formerly in the health sector, that's about 70% are women. And then when we start taking a look at where there is power aggregated, especially in decision making, political decision making, academia, and the private sector, we see those numbers quickly dwindling down. So one number um, that I'd like to point out is that the World Health Assembly, which is actually um, about to happen in about a week's time in Geneva, the World Health Organization organizes it and uh, governments um, from all around the world send um, a chief delegate that represents their country's interests. Um, we've been counting that number since 2015. And what we found is on average, that number is about 23%. And even in a virtual World Health Assembly, such as last year, we saw that women were, again, only represented as head of delegations at 23%. Those numbers are consistent with the ministers of health, and those numbers have peaked no more than above 31%. So we haven't been able to break the 30% ceiling in global health. 
Um, when we take a look at top uh, global health um, uh, training institutions, public health schools, medical schools, we've seen that um, deans of these schools, 28% of them are, um, again, uh, women, so we've not been able to break that ceiling. And then when we climb up to the private sector, um, where there is a lot of power, um, a, and it is clearly a, a key driver of health um, around the world, less than 5% uh, of Fortune 500 companies are headed by women. Um, and these are uh, Fortune 500 healthcare companies. So we call this um, the leadership pyramid in global health. Global health is delivered by women, but led by men. Um, and other ways that we also see women's contribution in the health sector is that half of what women do in the health sector, which is about um, uh, 1.5 trillion is in the form of unpaid work. Um, so women contribute annually 3 trillion and half of that, which is 1.5 trillion equivalent to the GDP of countries like Australia remain in unrecognized and unpaid work. And this was published in a Lancet commission in 2015. Um, and then when we take a look at the data, um, uh, particularly geographically uh, broken down regions, and um, this is a snapshot of last year. We have data for um, uh, going back a decade into this, and the numbers don't change significantly. But what I wanted to point out is the continent of Africa and the region, which is called Afro by WHO, um, it tends to have higher representation of gender parity and more women heading delegations. There are several countries that have adopted quotas where um, their governments are by legislation required to have um, a certain critical mass of women in political leadership. Others have head of governments that have said they're gonna have 50-50 cabinets. So countries that um, are known for this are Rwanda, um, Ethiopia, Guinea-Bissau are some of the ones where we've seen uh, commitments like this. Countries like Kenya have uh, about a 30% requirement of having um, dedicated parliament spots. Um, and this quota system is often considered very controversial, but it's the only one that's proven to work. And then when you take a, a look at um, regions which are not doing as well, it's the Eastern Mediterranean region and the Western Pacific um, region. Um, those numbers are um, in the 15 percentage range. Um, again, there's cultural factors to that. There's also prohibitive policies that limit what type of work that women can do. Um, and um, there's a wide range of drivers of, of why there are greater inequities. And often it has to do with the fact that uh, particularly in the Whipper region, um, uh, women are often doing unpaid care work in higher numbers. Um, so this is the data uh, looking at trends in the last 15 um, 15 years. And so wanted to, um, again, show that the peak was in 2017 when the, there was 31% um, of the uh, chief delegates to the World Health Assembly were women. This is also a critical time. Um, this was the time that the WHO went through a leadership change. Um, Dr. Tedros, who is the head of WHO, made a public commitment to gender equality. And he also asked um, governments in their delegations to send uh, women in equal numbers. And so we believe that this has, um, you know, one of the reasons why we see this kind of uh, reflection in the numbers in 27 and 2018, but clearly um, things quickly dwindled, dwindled back. Um, and even in a virtual GA where there isn't uh, a virtual general assembly where there aren't some of the barriers that are often quoted for women, um, women were not uh, represented in equal numbers. And so another group that looks at um, this um, really global health leadership and looking at 200 organizations that are considered drivers of global, global health, and, and they've actually been looking at the data and dicing it in many different ways. And what they have, say is, have come up with in projections of power is that if you're a CEO, um, um, it's three times more likely that a CEO would be a male, four times more likely that you'll be from a high income country and 13 um, times more likely that you compete your education in a high income country. And um, this report called by Global Health 5050, I really encourage you to check out that website if you're really interested in the data on this and they dice the data again in many different ways. Um, and when you take a look at um, disease issues um, and going back to that, again, spectrum I had talked about on gender and whether we're, you know, being gender exploitative, gender blind, or being gender uh, sensitive, responsive, or transformative. When we take a look at the global burden of disease and some of the key um, 
areas of work in the sustainable development goals and in the sustainable goal on um, health and well-being, which is SDG three, um, two two examples of um, uh, areas where you would expect to have a gender um, at least responsive approach, um, universal health coverage, and another one, health workforce. Um, 47, half of those programs in universal health coverage do not have any uh, um, acknowledgement of, of um, gender or women, and only 30% of um, the programs that are looking and working on health workforce have an acknowledgement of gender and women. So you can see that even in, from a disease perspective, we're often operating in a gender blind manner. And then looking at the data of global health leadership, again, this work by Global Health 5050 is um, when we take a look at the fact that 80% of the world's population is based in lower middle income countries, um, you would expect the leadership of global health organizations to match that population or at least come close to it. But what we've seen is the numbers are exactly um, you know, flipped um, uh, in, in a different direction. So 50% of global health leaders of um, those 200 plus organizations are from the UK or the United States. Um, we have seen that if you take a look at board um, chairs or CEOs, again, decision-making power, 17% of those are from lower middle income countries. And then if you take a look at women from lower middle income countries, less than 5% of global health organizations are led by women from LMICs, while, whereas they are majority of the target population that our programming in global health is going toward. Um, so this is just, you know, a very stark example of the power differential. And um, we at Women in Global Health believe uh, that if we don't have leaders from the societies that we're trying to influence, we're going to continue to be approaching global health um, incorrectly, and we won't find the best solutions because we really have seen, you know, research that comes out of the private sector area that when you have diverse teams, there's more sustainable solutions, um, there's a better understanding of the problems, and also even more ethical approaches uh, in general. And if we are skewed to just one type of person leading and setting the agenda, um, it is quite problematic and probably the reason we haven't been able to um, see as much acceleration um, in achieving the health goals that were set in the Millennium Development Time and then now in the Sustainable Development Time. Um, and when we take a look at women's recognition in the health sector, um, these numbers again continue to play out. Um, and this is something that I really think as um, students entering the space or early career um, leaders in the space is that there are a lot of awards in medicine and public health and global health and the spectrum of that, uh, but too often women are not nominated. So if you do come across uh, professors or other educators or other mentors that you're working with that are very inspirational, take the time to nominate them and support their nomination you know, um, in a strategic way with other young people so that women truly um, get recognized and awarded for their contributions in global health. They make up majority of the workforce, but when you take a look at the uh, spectrum of awards that are given to women and just pointing out some of the really big ones, um, there's the Gardner Award in Canada. Um, when looking back at the past 100 years, less than 6% went to women. Um, collectively awards altogether, less than 10% went to women. And when we looked at data just for 10 years, these numbers did not uh, change significantly. Only 15% of all awards went to women. And so if you are engaged again um, in your career, uh, especially um, when you are entering undergrad and there's an opportunity to make nominations of recognition, think about it. Are you nominating men and women at equal numbers? And what can you do to um, intentionally nominate um, women um, that have inspired you or that are doing incredible work because uh, without that um, you know change we're gonna if we just wait for things to happen passively it's just not going to shift um, even though women are educated at equal or higher numbers have PhDs at equal or higher numbers in the United States for example for over the last um, 30 years. Um, and so as we go into examples of how do you drive gender transformative action, um, and I'm going to be coming uh, shortly to the Q&A part of uh, the section of the, of the talk, so please hold on to your questions and um, continue to send them in the chat. And so it, when we take a look at how women in global health as a movement is pushing for change, gender transformative change, we see ourselves operating at the global and local level. And so what that means is that at the global level, we target um, global health governance bodies such as the WHO, the UN, and the 13 other agencies that work on health 
explicitly at the global level. We put pressure on member states, which are uh, member states to the U UN. They're also known as governments. Um, and then we use our local chapters to push um, community level um, advocacy and pressure on um, the member states and also the global health agencies that work at the national level to really um, you know, commit to gender equality and drive the change and also to hold them accountable. We do this by providing technical assistance, so doing um, policy reports. Um, we also influence the language that is negotiated at the UN or language that is being negotiated at the regional level to include clear commitments to gender equality. And then we also um, acknowledge when there is good work that's happening and bring visibility to when there is gender parity or when there is a change in policy that addresses some of the deeper gender um, issues. And so this is our model at Women in Global Health of driving that gender transformative change. We really try to influence at all levels and use collective action, which is um, a, a philosophy from the International Labor Organization on how workers can negotiate their rights. It's been around for over 100 years. And so for us, the model of collective action is really critical to driving um, the change in this ecosystem. Um, in COVID-19 times, we launched a campaign, particularly on gender responsive global security, held over 100 different thought leadership events, workshops. And again, this is with all of our chapters around the world um, really being drivers of this. Um, we did a, a data review looking at COVID-19 decision-making, and we found that 85% of the national COVID-19 task forces were comprised majority of men. Um, this was looking at 87 countries, over 115 task teams. And this data actually fed into the UN process and shaped the World Health Assembly resolution on COVID-19. It also um, influenced uh, dialogues that were happening about the pandemic at all levels. Um, we also um, have broken down this data again by region. And what you'll notice is that um, what was surprising to us was that even places that were known particularly to do quite well on gender parity, such as the Afro region or African continent, um, even there, 92% of the task teams were majority men. Um, there were regions such as Southeast Asia, um, which were 100% of their task teams were majority men and um, Eastern Mediterranean region too. So it just shows us that even in a pandemic, when women were critical to the response and there was applause and recognition of women head of governments um, you know, all around, we were still seeing women being left out of task teams. The first task team in the United States that was announced uh, under the previous administration actually had zero women. They had 20 plus members, but zero women were in the first task team that was announced in the United States. Um, so when we think about gender equality, we always have to look at our own um, local context as well. Other examples of gender blind decision making, um, I've pointed out the one on, on personal protective equipment was often modeled for male bodies, which resulted in higher infection rates for women and also indignity for women health workers because often these uh, personal protective equipment did not factor in women's menstrual hygiene needs. Um, we also know in many countries, 30% um, um, that have filled out the WHO survey have reported that um, maternity and reproductive health services were stopped um, and disrupted during the pandemic and they were considered non-essential, but we know that pregnancy does not stop in the pandemic. Other examples is that there were lockdown policies that put women and children in unsafe homes and this uh, resulted in a sharp increase in domestic violence everywhere. So another example of gender blind policies, not that saying that there is, wasn't a need for lockdown policies, but there needs to be an assessment in making sure that women and children would have other options if their homes were considered unsafe. Um, so these are three examples of gender blind policies. And so Women in Global Health launched a campaign um, to really make sure that uh, the pandemic um, does not continue to be gender blind, but also we learn from this pandemic and future pandemic preparedness and response uh, is truly gender responsive. It's still a struggle to get this language into UN declarations or, or other um, negotiations. Even in, a, in the current US administration, there has been a clear acknowledgement of equity being a priority, but we still see that there are many documents in the global health security agenda that continue to be gender blind. And so um, we 
again, want to make sure that that gender is part of every uh, assessment and policy assessment because we know if we don't do that, we actually are causing harm and lives are lost as a result. And our agenda is quite simple. We're asking for women and equal decision making, looking at the safety of women um, in the health workforce, make sure they have safe and decent work conditions, making sure that women are compensated for the unpaid care that they do in their households, but also in the health sector. Um, those numbers in the COVID-19 have tripled in some, some places. Um, we're asking for gender responsive approach to collecting the health security data. We know early in the pandemic, um, data was not disaggregated by sex and gender or other um, aspects. Um, in, in the first few months, less than a dozen countries were reporting infections by sex. Um, and we also are asking for funding women's movements. We know that uh, women's movements build resilience in society. They're responsive at the community level when large um, programs and governments are not able to move as quickly. Um, we launched a list of recognizing women who are experts in um, health security to um, fill the gap when we noticed again, there were male, all male panels happening. Um, mainly men were being cited and credit on media interviews. And also we saw an up um, an increase in male um, publishing happening. So we wanted to be intentional about bringing visibility to the women who are experts in, in, the, uh, in health security. We launched a new report. So if you'd like to learn more about this, um, specifically, we have a report on our website, covid5050.org, where we uh, explain the gender impact uh, on women in the health and care workforce. Um, and some of those impacts I've already talked about, but this graphic covers the fact that women do feel that they've been left out of decision making. They did face higher rate of infections. The data shows that in up to 70 to 90% of infections in healthcare workers were women. Makes sense since majority of them are um, the frontline workers are women. Um, we see to see saw an increase in gender-based violence, increase in mental stress. Um, there was a lot of stigma, financial hardship, became very difficult to manage childcare, homeschooling, and taking care of elderly while also um, being a critical part of the health response and um, very high rates of burnout. Um, there are projections that um, women in the health workforce will actually leave um, in the next year or are already leaving because of the fact that they haven't been supported in their roles appropriately. Um, and so our key message here is that women deliver a health and a social care. They deserve um, um, to have a new social contract where their expertise is actually um, considered valuable and they get safe and decent working conditions and they get an equal role in decision making. And if we look after our health workers, they will keep us safe as well. And we have to do this from a gender transformative way. Without doing it that way, we're going to again keep making the same mistakes. And so, um, uh, the final uh, framework I want to leave you with as you're thinking about how can you um, be part of uh, closing the leadership gap in health and, and care. And um, one thing to point out is that there is really great data and wherever you're advocating or trying to bring change, uh, you're going to be asked, where's the evidence? Where's the data? And so Women in Global Health with the WHO launched a report in 2019, which is a WHO report. Um, and that is uh, really valuable in being able to bring the case wherever you go about the um, the leadership gap in global health. And we cover a couple of themes in, in that particular report, but the main things that we wanna drive home is that gender leadership gaps are driven by stereotypes, um, discrimination and power imbalance and privilege. Um, second, women's disadvantage intersects with other identities and we've emphasized race and class. Um, an example of um, the healthcare infections here in the United States is that if uh, women, particularly that were uh, women of color, black women, migrant women had higher rates of infection and death um, amongst health workers than other groups. And so that's an example of where race is intersecting and class is intersecting. We know that global health is weakened when we exclude female talent ideas and knowledge. We also know that women leaders are often expand the health agenda and strengthening health for all. So they're more likely to bring a comprehensive health agenda forward and look at issues of social determinants of health, advocate for social protections, which are all critical to health and well-being. And we know that gendered leadership gaps in health is a barrier um, to reaching SDGs and UHCs. Too often, um, we uh, view that leadership is male. Um, we've done focus groups in, um, 
in sub-Saharan Africa, for, for example, and asked um, students to draw uh, what or sketch out what leadership looks like. And too often they drew out men and masculine traits, but we know there is value to also having some of the feminine traits in leadership um, be part of core leadership. And that means like being empathetic um, and uh, pushing forward for social protections. And these were characteristics that head of governments um, and such as uh, the head of government for New Zealand as often cited um, as showing empathetic leadership that le led to uh, uh, better health outcomes in COVID-19. Um, the ecological model is a way to map out barriers. So if you are wanting to do your own gender analysis, I encourage you to look at the ecological model and it's looking at barriers at the individual, interpersonal, institutional and community factors. Um, and the framework for change is building a foundation for equality, addressing social norms and stereotypes, fixing workplaces and systems and not women. So there's too often an effort to say, let's invest in mentorship and invest in training programs for women. But in reality, we haven't changed the environment. And it's also making sure that everyone realizes that gender equality benefits all genders. Men are losing out as well when there's gender unequal workplaces. They don't get to spend as much time with their um, families. They don't get to pro provide caretaking roles. And actually that is something that, um, you know, if we could pass one policy, which is paternity leave, it's more likely to create gender equality in the workplace. And we also need to enable women to achieve, um, you know, uh, we need to create environments where women are getting visibility and supported because too often they are not. Um, and so this is the four action areas. Um, this tool kit will be launched by the WHO um, in June, where you can find out more about this framework for change. Um, so on that note, um, I want to close by saying that 2021, even though we're on nearly uh, at half point for the year, there's still a lot of opportunities and issues to look at to advance the equity agenda. We still have um, unfinished business when it comes to equity and vaccines. Um, we know that the Black Lives Matter movement um, that not only um, was an awakening in the United States and influenced the way that people look at global health around the world um, and societies um, themselves reflecting on issues of power and privilege, conversations on decolonization. Um, we also know that um, there is um, some very big anniversaries and particularly it's the 26th anniversary of the Beijing, Gen uh, Beijing platform um, which is um, the famous speech that's known as women's rights or human rights. And so we're celebrating that 26th anniversary. Uh, but as part of that celebration, it's actually a call for commitments to be made to advance this agenda since we are clearly still very far away from achieving gender equality. And I encourage all of you to join the Women in Global Health movement. Uh, I know I've covered a very broad spectrum of um, topics today in gender equity, but I hope this is a great foundation for you to continue to ask your own questions um, and challenge power and privilege through your own lens um, until we truly have equitable societies around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tutt. Um, I think we have quite a few um, questions in the chat. Uh, do you think the best way would be for the students who have questions to raise their hand and ask them directly? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I know we have, we have several, so I'm happy to go over a little bit if we need to as well. So, yeah. Okay. Um, sure, sure, let's do that. Um, students, if you do have a question, um, you can raise your hand. And then Dr. Dot, do you just wanna choose um, anyone? Yeah, so I'm gonna begin with, um, I'm just going top of screen. So I see Ta Tanvi, uh, your hands up. If you could briefly introduce yourself and your question. Yeah. Let us know where you're from, what grade you're in, and then your question. Okay, um, hi everyone, I'm Tanvi Thiri. I'm in ninth grade. And um, my question is, is there a youth chapter of um, Women in Global Health? Because I'd personally love to do something um, with your organizations. I want to help in any way I can. Hey, Tommy. Uh, well, thank you for your enthusiasm. I'm really excited to hear um, that, you, that uh, the presentation inspired you. And we currently don't have a youth chapter, but what we are encouraging is 
We have four chapters in the US um, geographically, one in Seattle, one in Washington DC area, another one in the Midwest, another one in Georgia, and a pipeline one in the Boston area. So what we're encouraging is that um, for young people to actually get engaged in those chapters. So that way you can be part of an intergenerational community. Um, and we would really welcome um, young people like yourself to, to join and create a youth component to these chapters. Cause we personally, our model, I didn't go too much into this, but our chapters, we try to keep them intergenerational because we feel there's so much um, to gain when um, people from all generations are connecting. And we also try to keep our chapters multidisciplinary. So it's women working in the health workforce, but also women that are researchers, policymakers in the private sector. And we encourage um, men to be allies and participate in the movement, as well as other genders too, to, um, to join. So uh, I'm happy to um, you know, rec uh, recommend which chapter to connect with. And um, CM has my contact information, so feel free to ping me. Um, I'm also pretty active on social media, so you can catch me on Twitter anytime. Uh, and I'll put my handle in. Um, and that's an easy way to DM me and I can connect you to other people as well. Uh, I see and uh, uh, Andrea Anna. Yeah, hi, um, I'm in 10th grade and I'm from Michigan. Um, and I just wanted to know, like, what advice, if you have any, do you have for women who want to pursue a career or leadership positions in global health like you have? Yeah, so um, great question. And one, one thing I'd like to say is that we all are leaders every day in our practice. And, um, and I think sometimes we forget the influence we have as, um, you know, people that might be considered, you know, less, less career, less uh, years under our belt. Um, I started in my student days to really get engaged in global health, not as early as, as all of you have. I wish, you know, global health was more established a field because I would have completely joined um, in organizations um, that uh, really engage young people. Um, but I did, um, I was pre-med and I got engaged in the American Medical Student Association. And then that, at that point in time, there is a international body, which is very similar called the International Federation of Medical Student Associations. And I started engaging um, early on um, through working groups and eventually ended up becoming the vice president for this international body and then the president. And that's how I really had my exposure to the World Health Organization at a pretty early age. I was going to World Health Assemblies um, in my first year of medical school already, um, part of different delegations and advocating for policy. Um, and so that was my tip to you is like, you know, find organizations that you can be a part of and stay committed um, to them. Um, and I was committed to the student organization for about seven years. Um, and that is a long time. But as a result of it, I was able to do some really cool things, work on policy, um, travel the world, um, get to know people from different cultures. Um, that organization has over 120 national member organizations around the world. And it was one of the best things I did. So my tip to you is um, you, you are practicing leadership every day. So think about um, how you can always be an active member of your society and community, find an organization or find a few to try out till you find the one that's the right fit for you. Um, most organizations will have some sort of youth engagement opportunity. Um, and if they don't, then um, you know, think about what is something you can co-create with others that have similar interests. You guys are 200 plus uh, students here connected um, and hopefully this platform can create more opportunities for you, but that's another way to practice leadership. Um, third is I always looked for opportunities that I was clearly um, uh, very passionate or interested in. So if there was something that um, was a little bit off the beaten track, I still pursued it. And it's uh, fascinating. I feel like global health is constantly evolving. So some of my early interests were seen as um, being radical. I wanted to be a doctor, but at the same time, be very politically active and know about public policy and learn about how do you drive um, political change. And about 10 years ago, when I was exploring these interests, everyone's like, why aren't you going for the master's in public health? And I was like, well, that's not going to teach me how to, you know, address the drivers of inequity in society. So I went for a master's in public policy. So I'd say also, you know, uh, pursue your interests and, um, and, you know, go, even if others say that it's, that doesn't sound right, you know, you never know um, what a particular journey will uh, lead you to. And so I encourage you to, especially during your early years, explore. Uh, I see uh, Jayla next, is that right? Jayla? Jayla. Jayla. Yeah. 
Um, so I was going to ask, what actions do you try to take to help people at the local level? Like, do you try to physically build clinics or encourage more people to become doctors, um, make education programs? Like, what? Yeah, so uh, great question. So for women in global health, what, what we do and what I'm actively part of is inspiring um, women to create women in global health chapters where they can then have a community of um, allies and women really supporting the women's leadership. And as a result of creating those chapters are um, many uh, examples I can give is like our chapter in Somalia, for example, uh, early on in the pandemic, Somalia was one country that was not disaggregating um, data on COVID-19 infections by sex and gender. And our chapter mobilized and did a radio campaign and um, worked as technical experts in the ministry to start getting at least partial data collection on COVID-19 infections by sex and gender. So by creating um, our chapter in Somalia, which was all locally driven and in supporting those women and in, in creating that chapter, they then go on to transform local policy. So that's one example. Another example is um, we support um, informal mentorship programs to happen. Um, globally, we don't have a big mentorship program because we feel that our, um, our model of um, driving change is to go beyond the individual and really look at institutional and structural barriers. Um, but our chapters, for example, create opportunities for um, women of different backgrounds, um, whether it is like disciplines or intergenerational to connect with each other so that they can then be encouraged to um, pursue interests and collaborate on a variety of, of global health issues. And then um, as a clinician side of it, when, uh, especially in my early days, um, I always made it a priority to um, train or get exposed um, to community um, health clinics that were um, in uh, lower socioeconomic neighborhoods or targeting um, particular ethnic groups. And so that was very formative in my early education years and um, helped me really understand the barriers to access that exist in the U.S. And now I advocate for that in, in um, a lot of the organizational work that I do, uh, both in women and global health and outside of it. Um, but those are some ways. And what I'd encourage all of you to do is, again, as you're looking at opportunities, Jella, is just, um, you know, what, what are things that you feel you um, don't have as much of an understanding for, or you have more interest, or you want to explore more, and try to sign up to get, get engaged. Um, and there's just many ways to locally um, drive um, global health. And um, I've always practiced um, up, up till most recently in lower socioeconomic background communities. Um, and that's been very rewarding in a way to just, um, again, fill the gap here in the US. Um, I see Amanda next. Thank you. And thank you for giving us such an inspiring presentation. Um, you're asked number four that you, you publish in your policy brief, um, gender responsive approaches to health security data. I, I'm wondering like, what are some examples of ways to make um, like data collection and presentation more, more equitable and gender responsive? Yeah, so um, yeah, Amanda, it's been a pretty interesting journey on like the sex and gender disaggregated debate, especially in health research. So one institution in the United States that really set the bar high early on is the National Institutes of Health. It's been probably um, maybe even 20 years now, but they started mandating that any grant that, that they give out requires having sex and gender disaggregated um, components to it. And if they're not, then they have to clearly establish why not. And um, even after NIH set that high uh, precedence, what we noticed is that um, the journals, on the other hand, the ones where research does get published, um, did not have the same <laughs> high level of standard. So um, the Lancet, for example, which is a, a pretty, um, I think, most known global health high, highest impact uh, factor journal, um, very recently in the last um, two to three years has established a policy mandating that again, you know, make sure you have your data disaggregated and if it doesn't, you have to explain yourself and then we have to consider whether or not we'll publish. And that's actually led to more of a, transform a transformation in the academic field. But in the, um, in the sort of 
classic health informatics field where a lot of the data is being collected um, in, by governments, um, we know that there is such a wide range and capacity. So they've all agreed at the UN to do this, that they will um, have gender disaggregated and sex disaggregated data, but they say that you know the reason they're not able to do it is because they don't have um, the funding to change your systems, they don't have the, the capacity and structure. And so we're asking a lot of NGOs that are the larger international NGOs that work in low resource settings to also prioritize that their health information systems um, are being uh, disaggregated and that they, that they support capacity building. Um, and we're also asking the WHO to be more intentional in creating um, that capacity. So uh, really, I think, you know, if we start integrating it as a requirement and policy in every aspect of our society, then we'll see the change. So if you see anywhere in your journey in, in research or exposure to research that they don't you know, collect data by sex and um, gender. And actually in the US, we should be uh, very intentional about going beyond that and including race and socioeconomic and um, sexuality as well. I mean, these are all stratifiers that impact our health. And so I think um, making the case and saying, why, why aren't we doing this? Because actually in the US, we have no excuse for why we're not collecting that type of data. Um, is it Saidam? Uh, yeah, hi. My name is Siren. I'm in ninth grade. Um, I have a question. So, like, from the way I sometimes see gender equality, it sometimes has to do with the attitudes of different people, many of which are deeply rooted. And so, how do you go about sometimes changing, having to change attitudes to influence policy and progress? progress, allow for the progression for gender equality, one that can be really, really hard? Yeah, great, great question. And um, what I wanted to do was in that uh, platform for change framework is say first is uh, creating the commitment, right? The clear acknowledgement that actually, you know, I or my working group or my institution, my organization, we are committed to having gender equality. Because I think if there isn't that first level of commitment, you're basically, it's an impossible task to really drive that type of change. And then it is about looking at where the barriers are and where the advantages are as well, um, especially where the barriers are for women, where are the advantages for men and how are we um, equalizing that? And then the root, you know, the root drivers is, as you said, the gender norms and roles that there are expectations that, um, well, men are gonna work harder um, and women will have kids. So therefore women will not work as harder or women like to care. So it's fine to give them the caring type of roles in a working group you know, let them be the minute taker. And there's all these things that are happening passively. Um, and so once you say to yourself, like, I personally want to be a more equitable leader, equitable in gender, but also in broader ways, how can I structure my, um, you know, practices and the communities that I'm a part of to look at these issues and think about how that we can be more, more equitable about. Second is like, you know, it's easy to also be a bystander and it takes a lot of courage for men to say, you know what, I'm actually going to step up when I see discrimination happening. Um, and, you know, an example is in the health and the health sector is one, one sector, which I didn't go into too many details, has very high numbers of bullying and harassment and sexual harassment. And this happens and affects all genders, but particularly women. Um, so fields like surgery are notorious for the type of bullying that men experience in it. But you know, the more we can make it a culture that we're not gonna have bystander effect um, and asking our institutions, can you improve the reporting system? They all say, well, there's a zero tolerance for discrimination here. There isn't any institution in the US that doesn't have a discrimination policy, but then why is it that we see rates of 50% discrimination and bullying happening in our health training programs um, in, in the United States? So there's a clearly transformative piece that needs to take place. And so knowing the evidence, working collectively with others, um, and, and then saying, you know, here's an issue that we can work together to change. Um, and then at the interpersonal level is uh, when you do see your colleagues, you know, uh, making the case that, well, you know, I think, uh, 
you know, women don't work as hard. That's why it makes sense for them to make $100,000 less in the United States as physicians, you know, challenging that and say, how, you know, how, how where do you see that, you know, and, and in general, most, um, you know, I've had those debates with my colleagues saying, um, women often have to work a lot harder because they're also taking care of um, other care responsibilities, not necessarily when you're at the very early years of your training, but once you're at residency or, or PhD or further higher uh, postdoc, those things really play themselves out. And I've had to talk to colleagues and say, especially some of my male colleagues and say, so who does your cooking and cleaning? And you'll find out that they have, you know, partner who is doing all that. <laughs> and um, so I think it's, you know, being comfortable to have these conversations with your generation it's harder to sometimes change the generations ahead of you. Um, and that's why I think, you know, for me, it's a top priority to connect with young people because I feel you guys have a lot more um, progressive ideas and willingness to change your mindset, but also don't assume young people are equitable on their own. They're raised in the same um, dynamics in society. So you have to challenge your own, um, own bias too. But it is a journey, and that's why I say gender transformative leadership is is a progressive process. Don't ever feel like you you get it, you've got it. I, I also myself am constantly learning how I can do better too. Uh, uh, Chitana, hi, Dr. Dot. Um, I just wanted to say I found your presentation very insightful. Um, I'm passionate about a lot of the things that you were talking about as well. Um, but one particular part of your presentation uh, really caught my interest. Um, the part where you said uh, in some countries and societies there were being quotas put in place for a specific number of women or people of color that have to be entered into the workforce or into hospitals or into a certain job. Um, so a lot of people, as you said, it, it is very controversial. So what would you say to people that are like, this is not necessary and that it's discriminating against, for example, the white male or like the more predominantly entered um, person into that workforce, what would you say to a person who says that this quota is not right? Yeah, so the first thing about debunking the quota myth is that it's not about advancing people that don't have a skill set. It's about um, equalizing people with the same level of qualifications and expertise and skill and making sure that they're all getting a chance to be looked at and considered. And too often, what you see in, in the most senior global health leadership roles is that the talent pool that they have narrowed down to pick from is majority men to begin with. So they, let's say there's a, you know, let's say executive director of um, Global Fund is opened up as a call and there's recruiting firms and there's governments and everybody's like, you know, trying to put candidates forward. Um, often these things are actually driven by government interest and donor interest more than anything. And so that, that talent pool, of, you know, 10 candidates have to select from. Um, so in a way there might be a hundred or a thousand people that apply, but you kind of have this talent pool of 10. Um, what we're often saying is at least make that talent pool 50-50 to begin with. Um, and it's, you know, what, what we see too often is that those talent pool um, uh, that they're going to be more selective, that are going to go through the rigorous interview process, they're often so skewed that it is usually the white male from the UK or the US that is overrepresented. Um, and sometimes even 100% or 90%, we're starting to see better numbers of representation. We're seeing at least make it an effort to make that 50-50 and give um, you know, an equitable chance for, for women and, and women, especially from diverse backgrounds to be considered. Um, and so it's not about reducing the standards. And I think it's also in a way raising the standards because um, for, from white men, from privileged backgrounds, if you've been educated in the UK and US, you should have to compete with people from your own background too, right? Like, um, and if we say that they're the creme of the creme, we're in a field that is global health where 80% of the world's population and the target of a program is completely a different you know, population, we have to acknowledge the strengths of people that are coming from diverse backgrounds as, as a additive aspect. And um, too often that doesn't happen, but I'd say one, use the evidence. UN Women has really great evidence for why quotas work. Second challenge idea, this is not about um, uh, um, putting uh, candidates forward that are not qualified. It's about qualified people. Third, it's factoring in the, dis um, the advantages that men have and, and if we don't factor in the advantage they have, then it's not also a fair system for them too, right? Um, they are uh, 
you know, it's not truly um, the best person that's getting selected. They they have a far, you know higher advantage. Um, and the third or the fourth part I'd say, which I hope is long term change, is we ask our governments when they are nominating people for these most influential UN agency positions that they actually put um, a male candidate and a female candidate forward. But too often I've seen that they put a white male candidate forward um, and they don't put anybody else. And I mean, who can say in our 300 plus million population in the US that we can't find one talented uh, woman or one talented woman of color to put forward. So, you know, I think we have to really just get to the bottom and have some challenging conversations, but great question there. Um, I see Yuli, Yuli next. Um, hello, uh, I'm Yuli and I'm a sophomore from Virginia. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your time and presentation. Um, being in STEM, you know, I've definitely felt like, you know, that moment when you walk into a class and you're the only girl there. Um, I could definitely be wrong, um, but the social aspects of gender equality seems like something that's hard to measure exactly. You know, for example, like whether men and women are being treated equally within the workforce, not just in terms of um, how many women are there or working there, but whether or not their voices are being heard as equally as men. Um, so how can we determine if we're moving in the right direction in terms of, you know, the aspects that aren't as easy to give a quantifiable number to? Yeah, so uh, you're right that some things are, uh, are a bit more challenging to measure and there's, you know, quantitative and qualitative measures and in the gender equality space and especially in um, a lot of the sociological uh, area of study, one which unfortunately STEM education doesn't do a very good job, but I think we're starting to get better on qualitative data. That type of analysis is actually the best way to find out whether if things are truly improving. So I can give an example of a pretty prominent global health organization um, is often top rated in gender equality. They have like women in equal numbers in leadership. They've closed the gender pay gap. Um, they, they have all sorts of family friendly policies which men and women are able to access. Um, but what Women in Global Health has done is we've done some qualitative interviews with people just saying, so what is it really like? You, you, on paper, this organization looks stellar. And it turns out that you know even though there are these policies that men and women can both exercise. Actually, only women are taking the, mat uh, the maternity leave, but men aren't. So then men by default are being considered more valuable and, and they're getting more powerful positions, even though women are in equal senior leadership, but who gets the finance chair role, who gets the sort of, even in the C-suite, there are positions that are truly with power because they have a bigger budget or bigger team they're managing, or they're the more, you know, um, external facing role and, and women are given human resources or they might be given um, you know, some of the softer, softer aspects of senior management. And so that's about ways that you can begin with having qualitative interviews. And we're asking organizations that are truly committed to equity to make the effort to go through independent um, evaluations where there is um, audits of what the experience looks like. Um, the second thing is that there are indicators that are quantitative that give you a, a decent clue too. So asking the university, um, you know, how many men and women have they nominated for an award? And if you take a look at, you know, grant, uh, grant, um, grants that are given out, awards, recognition, it's a really easy indicator to see whether women are equally being valued or not. Um, and then it's also in lab teams, it's simple things like there's principles, there's actually guidelines that lab um, PIs um, can adopt that saying that, okay, the minute taker is not always going to be the woman on my team. It's actually going to, we're going to rotate minute taking, or we're going to rotate who cleans the lab on the weekend. Or, I mean, there's all these different things that are out there, but you can start, um, you know, adopting little practices at the interpersonal level, but institutionally asking for some qualitative um, analysis being done and not just the quantitative side. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Stephen? Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. for the uh, presentation. I quite enjoyed it. Uh, I was wanting to ask, uh, how did you get interested in the subject of women in global health uh, to begin with? Yeah, so um, my background, as I mentioned, was I was really engaged as a student in uh, already in the international space and global health policymaking. Particularly, I was working on issues such as having health in all policies, and um, and that is about turning to other sectors and saying, 
you know, do a health impact assessment and make sure health is part of your policy, because I do feel other sectors are um, key drivers of health um, and well-being. And um, as a clinician and even as a medical student, the health systems I was exposed to, um, I felt the solutions were not necessarily in um, the technical skill of practicing medicine or having access to medicines itself. It actually was the entire a you know, social structure and infrastructure and so many other aspects of um, why people are just not going to have a chance at having good health in their society. So I've always been in the spectrum of looking at issues beyond the sort of technical deep science or deep medicine side of it. And it was actually through this work where I was exposed to um, in global health, multiple disciplines, uh, training clinically, working in the policy space and seeing over and over again that there were so many talented women around, but like so many rooms that were just not diverse and um, diverse from a gender perspective, but also geographically. Um, and conversations were, and I'm, I'm Indian American. I was born in India, uh, came here when I was five years into the US. And so I've always had an immigrant identity to myself as well. And it was, I always found it a bit odd that people that had very little understanding of the cultures that they were trying to affect were setting the agenda and too often women and women's health agenda was being set by men and you're like something is just not right about these rooms and so i started by um going to some senior women who were in the field and asking them well you know, clearly there's an issue. What it, what are some things we can do? And they were like, well, you know, from our perspective, we see that the next generation should be the one to challenge challenge the structure. And um, and so that's how I started Women in Global Health was I was seeing so many talented women around, but not represented in leadership. And it really didn't make sense. And I felt so strongly that we weren't getting the best global health solutions because these women and also people from diverse backgrounds were not you know, the ones designing the solutions or setting the agenda. And, um, and I've always had an advocate side to me. So I launched the movement, um, you know, found other women um, through social media, went to a coffee table at the World Health Assembly, just creative of how we get into the World Health Assembly um, and launched the movement at a coffee table, inviting different influential global health leaders, men and women um, and other genders. And so I'd say that it was about really, I, for me, I'm driven by what's the root driver of problems. And in global health, I really felt that, that gender and equity and leadership is a key driver of why we're not solving the problems we have. Great, Alex. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Alex. Hi, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. I have a question about what we as high schoolers can do both in school and in our community, because given our age, some things we may not be able to do yet. Yeah, so um, Alex, I think the fact that you are already exploring a field like global health and all of you that have tuned in, I'm just so impressed and see, I'm, I'm just so impressed they have such a high demand conference that people have to get selected to. I mean, this is just, this is just so exciting. So I think the fact that all of you are so enthusiastic, I think that's great. And also um, there is a power in the community that all of you have here. You know, there, there is so much power in youth and young people. Um, and I believe it because I've lived it and I, it's how I came into where I am today. And I encourage all of you to connect with each other and think about what are some issues that you are collectively passionate about as young people um, and how can you bring your voice into different platforms. There are, are um, the UN makes it a priority to engage with, the U, uh, with youth. Uh, and especially if you're part of a group and the group is engaging, you can um, you know, voice your opinion about issues. You can demand for more investment into youth. Uh, programs, um, both here locally, but also globally. You can also engage the US government, um, since I'm assuming many are here based in the US on today's call um, to say, you know, we as, you know, global health, we as high school students interested in global health want to make sure that we're considered part of the pandemic response and we want more opportunities to get exposed to health security or, you know, I think there's so many different demands you can also make collectively together. So I do encourage that at, at a national level, um, at a very local community level. Um, not sure if you have a global health um, you know, interest group at your high school, but that's something, a great way to begin is those interest groups were always very formative and allowed 
um, allowed us to, um, as students, um, not only influence ourselves, but influence our faculty and our teachers and our educators to think out of the box. And um, you'd be surprised that actually as young people, you probably are more exposed to a diverse range of ideas than some of us that are already in our little siloed area of working. So, you know, holding many versions of this conference in your own high school is another, another great way. And the fact that we're in a very virtual world and people are more sensitive to being virtual, bring some of these conversations locally to your high school and maybe work with other student interest groups that are also keen on working on diversity and inclusion in some ways um, on these topics. And then there's always the research question. And um, again, I'm not sure of your individual skill set, but I'm seeing more and more younger researchers. Um, so I encourage you to think about what is a um, research question you could explore where you can add a gender, gender aspect to it or another aspect of from a power privilege lens, because um, there is a massive gap and, you, and all of you are going to be part of the, the generation that you know, helps us fill these different data gaps that exist. Great, so I see uh, Jada. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Jada Yang, a freshman from Los Angeles, and I think everyone here really wants to thank you for such a great presentation. Um, I think during the actual presentation, there was something about having people from multiple groups such as race or like disability or gender. And so I don't really usually see a lot of, for example, disabled people in leadership. And I was wondering how we can make sure that all of these communities are represented at a local level. And if that's not possible, how can we insert ourselves better in that way? Yeah, great, great question, Jada. And you know, that's um the disability community itself is probably one which is arguably um, one of the most um, affected by um, health disparities, especially in low resource countries. Um, and we have low resource settings here in the US too. So I, I, it is as much a local issue, um, but globally, um, they are the people that are often left behind. And I've seen this play in and out. It's um, with universal health coverage. We have some researchers looking at work in Kenya and it's women that are disabled, that have the least access to any health resources, and they're almost forgotten. They're not even measured in the health system. So I'd say the first is actually, again, uh, counting these people and making an effort to disaggregate data beyond um, just the singular, like people make it at least sex and gender disaggregated, make it at least, you know, add, add the ableism, add the race. And, and once you start adding these different indicators, it's not that difficult to go from, you know, a, a disaggregating things by two to like five. It's not that much of a gap. And I think that begin by making a case for that in your local, you know, wherever you can locally connect. And then second, you know, technology has um, made it so much more possible to um, have a many more people engaged that wouldn't otherwise. There's like simultaneous translation that's possible. I've been to many conferences where they have someone providing sign language simultaneously or YouTube translates um, sometimes live. A live trans not always the best, but there's just so much in technology that can help um, people engage from different people with different disabilities. And so if we build that into the design of our program, our work up front and look for funding to cover engagement with, with people that are disabled, that's also gonna create a more inclusive environment. And then also seeing that they have added value um, in making sure that our health programs reach everyone. I think without having the perspective of those with um, a wide range of disabilities, we're gonna again, keep designing health programs that miss the hardest to reach population. and um, so I think it's also about making the case that it's for better health as well. Um, but yeah, Jada, stay committed to that and bring that issue up at every time and, and know that the, there is progress and there are opportunities to use technology um, to help on this. And in the US, we have laws you know, mandating that we, we, sh we can't be discriminatory and it is discriminatory when we don't at least make the effort. Um, all right, great. I see Sh 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 Shrika, uh, is that right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, my name is Shrika and I'm a freshman okay. from Northern Virginia. Um, I saw that you mentioned about how it would take around 135 years till we reach gender equity. Um, what are some like steps that we can take on a local and national level to reach that faster? 
Yeah, so the, the breakdown from the World Economic Forum, what's neat is that those estimates can quickly jump up and down, which, which I always found really fascinating. I've been looking at those numbers for the last 10 years, and um, they've broken it down to economic, education, health, and political power. Some of those things we're already doing really well on, which is education. So we're ensuring girls are getting into um, primary and secondary education around the world, um, sustain so committed in investments and encouraging the US government to continue to make those investments. But areas where we're really seeing things not progressing is um, the economic aspect and the political. Um, and the economic, uh, there's some policies that would really improve the gender pay gap, which is one wage transparency. Um, we don't have that in the United States but in the UK, for example, any employer that has more than 100 employees is required to provide um, public wage transparency. And that has helped close the, the wage gap between men and women because then women and men are equally compensated for equal work. Um, and so the more we can sensitize people to the fact that transparency is better for equity. Um, so that's one you know, from the economic aspect of it. We also have too many women in the informal sector um, and that are not being compensated. Um, they're, they're often working on cash economy. We still see that in the US as well, but it's definitely a really large issue in uh, countries around low resource countries around the world where women in the community health workforce are not considered formally part of the health system. They might get stipends. So the more we say that, you know, actually we won't tolerate any informal unpaid work, that all type of work needs to be formalized and be part of the formal sector. And if we do that, it actually leads to more economic growth and creates more jobs. So it's not a cost. Um, and then the political power part of it, I answered this a bit earlier, so I'll just keep it brief, but um, setting quotas and um, making targets at every level of um, government. So um, there are a lot of opportunities in the local government um, for where yeah, we still see women are not participating um, and not getting selected or elected. Uh, and there's some NGOs that are particularly working on these type of issues. I know there's a one called She Should Run and there's a whole range in the US but I think, you know, globally, the more we can advocate that, you know, there should be no decision making happening without equal representation of men and women in a room is at least the bare minimum we can do. And so I think, you know, again, um, if we, there were more countries that passed quotas, for example, that um, estimation from World Economic Forum, I'm guaranteeing you, will drop down easily by 50, 60 years. So just sometimes a simple policy change um, in one sector can have a, a really vast um, impact on projection. Um, thank you. I also wanted to ask if we wanted to like um, contact you about any projects that we want to do related to this topic, like how would we contact you? Yeah, so I'll, you know, I'll provide my email address in here. Um, and it sometimes takes me a while to get back to people when it's because it, um, it's a it's pretty high demand these days. But do drop me a line. I promise I will get back to you or someone from my team. And then I'm also on social media. And that's another way if you want me to elevate a piece of work that you're doing. I love to especially when I see young people working on these issues and you want me to just, you know, spotlight it. I'm happy to also, you know, do that on social media too. Okay, okay. thank you. Welcome, uh, Nareen. Hello, I'm Naharin, a freshman from Georgia. So you mentioned how you are a practicing doctor as well as a leader in public policy. So I find that very inspiring because I'm conflicted between like wanting to be a practicing physician, but also in policy. So how has working in those two fields helped you in one or the other? Yeah, so going down the clinical pathway, it is one that is definitely requires a lot of dedication and there's no, how do, you, how do I say it? There's no like corners you can cut, like clinical training is long and it is um, detailed oriented and it requires you to spend a lot of time with patients. Um, there's just no way around it. So I think if you're pursuing uh, clinical interests, I'd say just, um, you know, ask yourself why and and how much, what about um, being a clinician or being a physician or other health professional is, um, you know, part of your interest. Um, for me, it was the fact that um, I, I just always felt that if I don't know what's happening at the bedside, how can I advocate for broader societal change? And so for me, the two were linked. Like I felt that if I was just advocating based on things I've read about, I would not be as informed. But the downside to it is that I also feel like at times I'm not the 
like, you know, as a much of an expert in the clinical field. So I'm an internist, I practice general medicine. And fortunately, we're, it's fine to be, you know, very general in how I practice. Um, but I do see that, you know, where most of my time goes to is, which is advocacy now that I, you know, I am a, a solid clinician, but I wouldn't say I'm like, you know, the world's expert on XYZ. So it does become challenging to have a, um, both tracks of your career, like accelerating at the same speed. Um, definitely one will move faster sometimes and the other one will slow down. Um, and it's just being comfortable with that and knowing, um, cause those people that go into medicine usually tend to have the personality of being exceptional and really working very hard. And, and that doesn't, and that system just sets that up, um, that you have to constantly work so hard. So the first, um, 12 years of my life, um, in, in clinical medicine, I was pretty much 90% dedicated to just that and had 10% to do policy interest. Um, and then it was really once I, I finished training that I could control my time and I knew enough of clinical medicine where I could make the decision that, okay, I'm only gonna practice clinical 20, 30% and I'll still be comfortable and I can do more policy work Has my policy work um, picked up. But you'll notice some people take longer. They might do clinical medicine for 20, 30 years and then get into expert groups. But if you have a policy interest, I encourage you to, you know, um, to build it in, um, in your, in your career pathway. And there's always ways to be engaged, but just know it's okay to feel like you might not be moving as fast in one because that's the normal um, pace for those that try to have like dual careers. Great, Yash. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was super informative and really inspiring. I wanted to ask how um, can education on like a K through 12 level play a part in increasing gender equality and allyship in global health and how we can reform our education system, our education system to do so. Yeah, so Yash, um, I think uh, our education system is really overdue in reform. Um, I had a really tough time actually in high school because I used to be one of those people that already from an early point had a social justice background and felt that curriculum, um, you know, just didn't cover it. We were looking at history without, you know, really decolonizing it, for example. Um, I mean, these are heavy words that make people uncomfortable. And I'm hoping that, you know, our, our teachers are more, um, more and more awake than they were before, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think opened up eyes significantly in the United States. The fact that our country is torn uh, politically in many different ways, the fact that we are, you know, even acknowledging the hate crimes that happen to Asian Americans and especially Southeast Asian Americans. I mean, this is all stuff that that should have been acknowledged and been part of our curriculum from a, I'd say even formative years like primary education and it just isn't. So I think that students have um, some bit of a responsibility and opportunity to demand for, for this type of education. Does it mean that it'll happen the year you're in school? Maybe, maybe not, you know, <laughs> but I think the fact that you um, are a uh, target of that education that you have an ability to influence and um, you'd be surprised how open even local legislators are. Um, so education at the high school level is shaped by the state um, and less the federal government, sometimes the federal government. So, you know, I think engaging on these issues and saying, you know, how do we have curriculum in high school that introduces us um, not just to race, but also looking at things from a power privilege lens, because I think that is what we're, we make a case for in women in global health that, um, you know, if we only look at things from an isolated way, we're not really getting to the, the, the root drivers. And it's about having an, a, a way to analyze our own behaviors and the behaviors of our organizations and institutions. And, uh, and depending where you go to school, it really makes a difference. Like I said, I had a really tough time in high school um, being able to work on these issues. And I was very passionate about race and um, it just wasn't brought up as much. And so it did mean, you know, a lot of challenging <laughs> conversations. It meant sometimes I did get into trouble too. And uh, my Indian uh, parents had a hard time <laughs> understanding that. So I have to say I was a little bit of a rebel, but in college, 
college and university, there is much more opportunity and um, interest for that. So I'd say, you know, keep up with your interest, try to find other like-minded people, um, try to engage with local legislation, try to influence the school body board. If they don't get the demand, if they don't hear that students want these type of topics, then they're just going to ignore it and keep things as is. So, um, you, you know, young people can be politically active. And I, you know, remember I started protesting sometime when I was 12 or 13. And, um, you know, I think just just find ways that you can stay engaged and influence society. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Avigna next. A Avi, Avigna? Uh, yeah, it's Avigna. Avigna, okay. All right. I'm yeah. just, <laughs> thanks. No, no, no. I'm trying. I should. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the incredible presentation. Um, so my question was about the compensation aspect that you brought up. Uh, you mentioned that about $1.5 trillion um, in health contributions by women was going unrecognized or um, properly compensated. Um, so what are there any like significant factors that play into the statistic? And what do you think should be done to better uh, recognize women for their contributions in health? Yeah, so um, there's this Atlantic Commission called women and health um, and it was released in 2015 it's a it's a long read but they have short sections in there that you can pull out the topics you want to um, unpack a bit more so there is one where they talk about the economic contributions of women and that commission was really focused on looking at women in the health sector not just as recipients of care too often we talk about women's health but not women's role in the health sector and so the these findings of this early data, they actually project that the contributions that women have are more than 1.5 trillion, but what they were able to get in you know, this early data uh, analysis in 2015 was at least 1.5 trillion. And what that's looking at is, if you take a country like um, India, for example, um, India has a very large population, doesn't have enough health providers, uh, formal health providers to reach the population's health needs. We're seeing that play out right now in the pandemic. Um, I, you know, it's really heartbreaking, but for me, I'm not surprised by it. I, I, I had been exposed to India's health system um, in the 1990s, and that's what brought me into health anyway, seeing that how weak the health systems are, but too often they are built on um, volunteer work from women. So you have, um, most health systems will have like the health professionals that they consider doctors, nurses, dentists, pharmacists. So these are your allied health professionals. And then there's the next cadre of workers, um, which is community health workers, and they come in many forms. Uh, community health workers um, in India can come as uh, what are called auxiliary nurses, or ASHAs um, that are have some bare minimum training, but they're essential for community health. Um, they're the ones that live in these communities and go door to door, um, but they're not considered part of the formal health system. So their compensation is actually um, what's called stipend based or at times, um, you know, bare minimum, like just like a tokenistic. So in COVID-19, ASHA workers, for example, were getting $12 a month um, to provide COVID um, screening, testing, education, and even for India standard um, that is really subpar, like it's not living wage, yet they were part of the essential um, health worker system and they had no rights if they ended up getting sick or um, you know, having to take time off, they don't get any compensation even. And so that's an example of where a majority of the health service delivery that India does at the community level is dependent on a volunteer cadre system. And those women are um, not formalized. And so if we could formalize them, recognize them as health workers, give them appropriate training um, and compensate them for the work that they are doing per living wage, then we would close some of that gap of the 1.5 trillion. And it was at least a million ASHA workers that went on strike during COVID-19 because they weren't even paid what they were promised for six months. So even that $12, they weren't receiving that. And that's how, um, and didn't have per, uh, personal protective equipment. This is also um, in, happening in many, many countries. I just picked on India because it's uh, one where it's the largest example. Counter that to a country like Ethiopia, um, they overnight um, a few years ago formalized all their community health workers, which was around 20, 30,000 community health workers. 
And now those community health workers are part of a training program so that they can either stay as community health workers or they can go on to become a nurse or midwife if they want to, and they get living wage. And as a result, um, Ethiopia says that the reason they've been able to drop their maternal mortality rate is because of the formalization of the community health worker. Um, and now those workers do get living wage. Um, so it is all about recognizing the contribution, formalizing it, challenging the gender norm. Um, these women have often said when we've asked for compensation, because they do, they do create unions and try to negotiate with the government. They're told, oh, well, why are you asking for money for things you already do in your household? Don't you already care for your husband and children? So caring for your you know, neighbor and your neighbor's children, why are you asking money for that? <laughs> and so the gender norms are that women just like to care and, and actually they, they want to have their own, um, they want to bring money into their households and they want to have their own economic power as well. And that's currently being denied. Um, so there's definitely, we see this as one of the most promising areas to accelerate change. If we can get women's economic empowerment in the health sector, it really will have long lasting effects. So great question. Um, Ariana? It was an amazing presentation, really loved it. Um, so one thing I just wanted to ask about was like, I'm really interested in my goal health, obviously. I'm also like computer science. And I was just wondering like in general, like what other like careers and professions like in your experience have like intersected with global health? Yeah, Ariana, great question. I would say everything out there and especially this pandemic has shown us every single sector can be part of global health in some way. Um, you know, the digital and innovation space is one that we need many more women in. Um, the fact that you're mentioning computer science as an area of interest, I would fully encourage you to pursue that and know that global health will be a part of, of that field for you if that's an interest. Um, one of the growing areas is digital health, but also just innovation in the health space that includes digital technologies and non-digital technologies. Um, we, we need um, more and more um, people with diverse backgrounds going into this field. So um, global health is where I have colleagues at work from a wide range of areas. I've met people that do artificial intelligence uh, to communications, to ed being educators or being um, uh, researchers that are uh, you know, researching in the lab as science researchers or those that do more policy type of research. So it's such a multidisciplinary field. Um, and I would encourage um, those, and I know that traditionally it was clinical people that went into global health. And now what you'll see is that there's more and more people from different disciplines going into global health. And we need that because global health is looking at things from a political perspective and looking at the social determinants of health. And unfortunately, clinical training won't give you that. So, um, and that's why I say for those that are interested in clinical training, that's great. We need more global health minded clinical doctors, but really be sure that, um, that you have a strong passion for that kind of patient care level. Otherwise, all other disciplines are in greater demand. It's almost also easier to get a job in global health if you bring a different uh, perspective. Like if you come from finance, for example, or um, yes, everything in this sort of um, other STEM um, outside of medicine is in great demand too. So um, don't feel like you have to you know, take the traditional health route or public health route to be in global health. Great. I think last but not least, uh, is it uh, an, uh, an, uh, Anshika? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Anshika. Anshika, well, great. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for such like an informative presentation. I really enjoyed it. But uh, my question was, how do we include like trans and non-binary non individuals in global health and gender equality advocates? Advocacy, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, I think one, you know, when we talk about gender transformative leadership, um, I wanted to emphasize that it is about looking at people not just from the binary aspect of men and women, but actually that, gen that gender is a spectrum. Um, and second, being inclusive and being inclusive of other groups in, in the efforts of um, transforming institutions. And where we have to um, realize it is that, especially when it comes to transgender rights, it is, um, wide spanning on where there are gen transgender rights and where there aren't. And it doesn't always like go across the expected cultural um, uh, groups. Like sometimes there's a notion, well, okay, well, if you're in the global north, you're probably more, you know, accepting of transgender rights. And actually there are 
parts of uh, Asia that are more accepting of transgender because that's been culturally a group that's been um, like India and Pakistan are known to have communities of intersex and transgender um, for, for centuries and they've been integrated into society and do have some form of, you know, some rights, I wouldn't say equal rights. So I think that the first is acknowledging that they do exist. Second is acknowledging that every uh, cultural um, or, or every society might have a different, a different um, understanding of, of those communities and what kind of rights they have. And then in global health, what we need to do is include language in, um, in designing our programs or policies or any agreements that we're having that gender is spe all spectrums and that there are people that are not men and women that need to be included in, in the program design. And too often that's not happening. I mean, right now we're struggling with even getting women into, into, into the language. So I have to say it is um, what, I, what I would say to all of those that are working on gender transformative leadership approaches is that make the effort to um, be more inclusive and make the case for women, but also try to make the case for all the other underrepresented genders too. Thank you so much for uh, the wonderful presentation and taking the time to answer all the questions, uh, Dr. Dutt. Uh, I'm sorry we went quite a bit over what we had scheduled, but our students in the conference uh, team really appreciate you speaking with us today. Uh, and you've definitely inspired some new uh, leaders in global health. Great, and uh, it's been such a privilege and I'm just really, you know, I was very surprised to see so many of you on this talk and uh, and see so much interest. So please stick with it. We need minds like you joining the field and um, and really it's, it's an exciting field to be a part of and I wouldn't change what I do. And I welcome all of you to the field. So stay committed. Um, CM knows how to get connected with me. Um, but like I said, tag me on social media. I'm pretty active on Insta and Twitter and I'm happy to elevate your own projects and work. And I hope many of you will consider joining our chapters of women in global health. Um, like I said, we're spread across the US and then, um, are, have virtual engagement opportunities. And really there's a lot of work to be done. So I look forward to working with all of you in some way in the future.